it's really wonderful to be back at ACUS again, and uh, I really uh, have enjoyed all the times I've been visiting you and being at podiums like this, because this is really something uh, I think is very important to do as an outreach, coming from a European country, uh, interacting with our closest ally, the US. Uh, but I'm also glad, Damon, that you mentioned uh, the RIMPAC exercise in 2014, because that gives me a good opportunity to talk about the fact that I participated, not as a naval officer, I would say, but as a defense minister, because RIMPAC took place in Hawaii, and we sent a Norwegian frigate. And uh, that was actually the frigate in the exercise who had the longest journey to get there, and also because it took the trip alongside the coast of the US going to Hawaii. And as a defense minister, I of course had to um, make sure that I visit my troops. It's hardship. But when they were in Hawaii, I had to go to Hawaii. So that was really actually, aside from the trans strengthening the transatlantic bond, it was also very important for other reasons, as you can easily imagine. The Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, very often says that NATO is the most successful military alliance in history, and I think that he's right about that. <clears throat> but that's the reason why that is true, is because NATO is an alliance that is not built on short-term national interest. It is built on shared and lasting values. And that's, what, that's what makes it special. It's democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. And that's not only the preamble of uh, the Washington Treaty, but these are the very principles that we have pledged to both protect and preserve, and they are the values that bind our alliance together. And I think we're at the core here, and I want to start out with a couple of remarks um, on exactly this point. Because sometimes you get the notion that NATO is first and foremost a military alliance. But actually, NATO is first and foremost a political alliance. The values that bind us together are the important things. So we have promised each other to protect these values <clears throat> when they are threatened, either in our own countries or in other countries. And we will also protect them whenever an ally or the alliance as such is threatened. And this is the main reason why we're not only stronger together, but we are stronger than the sum of allies. Our belief in democracy, in individual liberty, the rule of law, is not shared by all. And today, I think it's fair to say that the rules-based international order is under pressure. And the hard-won principle that rules and norms should govern international relations is being challenged. And I would like to, at this point, also underline that we should all remember that that rules-based order is an architecture that we built stone by stone, brick by brick, for the last 70 years. We built it on the ruins of two devastating world wars. And we have to remember why we built this architecture. And now it is under pressure. And the optimism that dominated the first two decades after the fall of the Berlin Wall is behind us. Well, history is not over, as some argued in the early 90s. Instead, history has a tendency to make some surprising twists and turns. And that has happened before, and I'm sure it's going to happen again. That's also one of the very reasons why we founded NATO in 1949. <coughs> Because in an unpredictable world, we as NATO's member states have promised each other that we will come to your defenses if you are threatened. And this is ultimately why we have once invoked Article 5, and we are still standing shoulder to shoulder in Afghanistan 17 years later. And this is ultimately what NATO is all about. We have promised to send our women and men in uniform to protect each other's freedom and independence, to protect our way of life. And said more directly, this is the reason why we as political leaders are willing to ultimately risk the lives of our soldiers to defend each other. 
That was true in 1949. It's equally true today, even though there are some disagreements between Europe and the United States at the moment. While the strength of NATO lies in our principles and, and all the high ideals that we're now talking about, they must, of course, be matched by careful planning and attention to detail. And the strength of our alliance is now called upon not to fight a war, but to deter aggression. And this is the interest not only of 29 allies, but of all countries that believe might does not make right. And since the World Summit in 2014, we have adapted as an alliance to a changing security environment by creating new defense plans, strengthening our capabilities, stepping up training and exercise. Allies have turned around a downward spiraling trend of defense spending, which is very important. And it's been done in an open, measured, and defensive manner. And I have to say from Norway's perspective, that NATO's enhanced understanding of the challenges that we're facing in the North, as well as the strengthening of the command structure and the maritime dimension, they are, of course, especially important measures, and I will get back to them quickly. As you all know, the bulk of Russia's strategic deterrent is placed on the Kola Peninsula, and that's just across our border. And in the event of crisis, Russia would seek to activate its so-called bastion defense concept to make sure that it can protect these capabilities. So the High North is an area of strategic interests where the strategic interests of NATO meets those of Russia. And this is the northern maritime flank of NATO. And we're pleased with the agreed adaptation of NATO's command structure, which Norway has promoted for the past four years. Um, and as I've said a couple of times, I, I remember the working dinner in NATO when I presented the idea of looking into the command structure. And I also remember the looks I got from the people around the table. But now we're there. We have undertaken the assessment, and we've found out that NATO's command structure is not fit for purpose, so we have to do something about it, and that is being done now. We also uh, have done adaptations to make sure that the command structure can lead larger joint operations, namely collective defense operations. And a new joint force command will be placed at Norfolk, which will be very important. And it constitutes a substantial strengthening of NATO's maritime dimension and defense and deterrence uh, generally. Of course, Norway, given our geography, is naturally focused on the North Atlantic, but that doesn't mean that the South is not as relevant to us as well, because this is about our shared collective security. And all member states need to, um, need to see that their security interests are taken care of. So NATO, in my opinion, has shown that it's able to adapt in a united, efficient, and timely manner uh, to the changing security situation. And I think that this successful adaptation that we've been doing now for some years also needs to be highlighted at the summit in two weeks' time. But this is not to say, and I would like to underline this, the job is not done. We still have a lot to do. Much work remains when it comes to, um, to both command structure and, and also defense planning, military mobility, to name just a few. But I also think that improved burden sharing is not going to go off the agenda. I think it's going to be important also continuing the discussion. And we should all strive to deliver on the Wales pledges. Norway has increased our defense spending by 24% in real terms since 2014. And that's quite a large undertaking. And we will continue to increase and further increase towards the 2% target in the next long-term plan that starts in 2021. So we now have a current four-year plan and we're going to get a new four-year plan when this one uh, comes to an end. But we're also making a lot of investments. As you know, the NATO target is 20%. We are now currently at 27% and we're going to peak at around 33%. And we're making investments that are not only good for national security, they are vital also to allied security. 
We are purchasing 52 brand new F-35s. We've already gotten the first six planes and they are working uh, perfectly, I would say. Uh, at least according to our pilots, they are very happy. We're also purchasing five new P-8s, four new submarines. Uh, just yesterday we signed a contract on three new Coast Guard vessels. Uh, we are investing in intelligence capabilities and also Army assets. Although enhanced deterrence is necessary, I'd also like to, to point out that we do not perceive Russia as a threat to Norway today. And um, I would say, unlike the impression you can get if you watch the highly popular series Occupied, uh, it is nothing imminent. Um, but Norway's relations with Russia is actually a constant, and it is an important and very vital element in our foreign and security policy. And Norway's policies towards Russia will continue to be both clear, firm, and predictable. Those three words are very important in dealing with uh, Russia in foreign policy. So for decades, the Norwegian policy towards Russia has consisted of two interdependent but also mutually reinforcing pillars. The first pillar is our NATO membership and our close ties with Western allies and partners, most notably our closest ally, the US. And the consequences of our NATO membership is very well known to Russia. And it is no surprise to Russia that we do exercising, training, that we have joint, um, joint exercises also. The one we will have this fall, Trident Juncture, is a very good example of that. And the second pillar is our practical cooperation and bilateral dialogue with Russia. And being neighbors, both are equally important. So our aim is to have a very firm and clear stance, for instance, on the illegal annexation of Crimea, on human rights abuses in Russia, but at the same time, pursue a constructive and practical dialogue in areas where we have common interests. And those are many because we are neighbors and in an, in an area uh, where strategic interests meet. The last few years has shown a very changed security landscape in Europe. Great power politics, traditional geopolitics has really entered the stage again, and new challenges are also emerging. But at the same time, Europe is actually struggling to deal with a number of quite essential but sometimes also difficult uh, challenges. Uh, and we can see that in the European debate uh, as we speak. And the upcoming summit uh, that will be held in, uh, in some days now will, will also um, probably underline a lot of that. We also see rising populism in several countries. And this is the context in which the NATO summit also will be held. The goal of moving towards spending 2% of GDP on defense will be the main theme and topic at the summit. <clears throat> we should be very clear on the positive trend in NATO defense spending, but also the need to do more. I will, however, say that a single-minded approach to this goal will probably not lead to a successful summit, but rather to undermine some of the allied cohesion that we need. And this is why Norway's number one priority at this summit is to maintain the political cohesion of the alliance. And I would say it even more precisely, we must strive to maintain the strong transatlantic bond. And we will do so in highlighting the uh, achievements that I just told you about, but also by pointing to the future and looking into new deliverables and new ways of strengthening our alliance. American leadership has been crucial ever since the signing of the Washington Treaty, and it will be so in the future as well. I can say that allied reinforcements across the Atlantic is obviously extremely important uh, also for Europe. But over the last decade, we've also seen a strengthened bilateral defense cooperation between Norway and the US, consisting mainly of uh, two to three uh, big pillars, but a lot of other things as well. One is pre-positioning of military equipment. We've had it since the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s. Uh, we also have extensive training and exercise. We've had a very successful training and exercise program with the US Marines, uh, 350 Marines doing training and exercise in the middle of Norway. 
And uh, we are now increasing uh, because we mutually find it very beneficial that we are training together with the Norwegian forces. Um, so we, we are now increasing to around 700. And that is something that is, is very good. We're still far away from the times during the Cold War when the number of Allied soldiers uh, training and doing exercise in Norway was much higher. But this is good, and this is what we, this is a wanted policy both from Norway and the U.S. And to do the training and exercise together because that gives interoperability and it actually gives us a lot of benefits. Of course, the U.S. Marine Corps has no operational duties or, or tasks in the Norwegian Armed Forces, but they are training and exercise alongside other allied uh, forces as well. We're doing it also as part of a broad political consensus. We also have intelligence cooperation. We also share a lot of the same operations that we're working shoulder to shoulder in Afghanistan, in Iraq. We currently also did so in Syria. The importance of, of U.S. can hardly be overstated, but however, just simply calling for American leadership will probably lead us nowhere. So as Europeans, we will also <coughs> have to take a stronger leadership. I will, however, caution against the idea that this is about our security and your security. It's about our shared security. <coughs> and to make sure that that security now is dealt with. I need to just take a little bit of a coughing medicine. <coughs> you will have to excuse me. You're not going to see this. <laughs> Happened. <clears throat> so that's how it is to be in air-conditioned environments for a long time. <clears throat> so my point is, that both Europe and the U.S. needs to assume leadership to make sure that we can move forward together on these important issues. But we should not shy away from the difficult issues. And I, I'm talking about no surprises right now when I say that, yes, there are strains regarding trade, regarding JCPOA, as two examples, <clears throat> where I think that this will also be be part of the discussions um, in the future. However, despite these discussions, that has always been there. I mean, to some extent or other, it has always been discussions between Europe and the US on some issues. Despite that, we share some very real security challenges. <clears throat> Those are the ones we should focus on. We have to come together to deliver on deterrence, on collective defense and on preparedness. And I strongly believe that the bonds and values that bind us together are so much stronger and so much more important than the issues where we disagree. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, I would just like to conclude by saying that <clears throat> political cohesion is key to NATO's continued success. And it cannot replace, be replaced by any other topic or any other issue. It is actually the key. We have faced in NATO huge challenges before, several times since 49. But again and again and again, the alliance has shown and proven that it's able to adapt and able to overcome differences. The essence of the strength that makes these challenges possible to overcome is that we are united by values and interests that run deeper than the disagreements of they. And I hope and I believe that when we meet in Brussels, Damon, uh, you and I and all the others participating will focus on these values and these interests that unite us. Thank you very much. Looking back over the past few years, what is your assessment of how far the alliance has come and that reanimating its commitment to collective defense? Mm. And how much further do we need to go in terms of adaptation, where this will be a big issue at the summit on mm. issues of readiness, military mobility? What's your sense of how far the alliance has come, how far it has to go? 
Well, I think <clears throat> I think that since 2014, there is a shared understanding of, of the things needed to be done. And I think things have moved quicker than many anticipated at that point. I remember well being uh, present at the NATO ministerial where we actually experienced the invasion of Crimea. And I think no one expected this to happen. I, my first... Um, my first NATO ministerial was in October of 2013. I was just one week old in the job. And I remember one of the guests at the NATO's, uh, NATO ministerial was the Russian defense minister. Um, that was <laughs> the first and the last time I, I saw him, in a way. Um, but but it, it tells a story about where NATO was in 2013-2014. In and, and the hopes of a stronger partnership with Russia, the hope of, of or maybe to a certain extent also shying away from what happened in Georgia and, and thinking that that was in a way a deviation of the path towards uh, a more Western style Russia. I think that took some by surprise. Uh, some other countries were not taken by surprise at all. And uh, what actually happened uh, also forged NATO to look closer into how we can um, strengthen the alliance and the military posture of the alliance. And remember that coming from many, many years where collective security and collective defense was actually put in the backseat of many of the other discussions going on in NATO. So we had to do a lot of groundwork. We had to start from the beginning many places. And, and that's why I mentioned the, the story of, of the response I got when I started talking about the need for revising the command structure because it's such a sensitive topic in NATO and it has always been because ultimately this is about where the bases should be, this is about where the command structure should be and, uh, and where the commands should be. So um, you can easily imagine that it was very difficult to put that on the table. At the same time it was necessary to start that, that discussion and ultimately that led to uh, the assessment and, and also now the results and I think everyone realizes that, that it was not enough just talking about the enhanced security. We had to do something about it in real terms. Defense spending, we had to change the command structure, we had to make sure that we again could do joint allied operations because we were, especially in the maritime domain, we hadn't been focusing on that for, for many, many years. Well, at the time, you, I remember talking to Norwegian <coughs> officials and you felt almost as if you had the, all, all of the North Atlantic to yourself. Yeah. And the alliance is sort of outsourced to Norway, taking care of the North Atlantic, quite a change from Cold War days, obviously. Has that particular element, do you feel that that has evolved and changed? We do have more American Marines deploying in, in Norway. But how is that sort of uh, set of issues where I think you, in some respects, felt, I don't want to say fully alone, but in some respects, um, really had the overwhelming set of responsibility of what was happening up north. Has that begun to evolve in a more shared burden sharing among the allies? Yeah, I would absolutely say so. And I think that what we have seen if we're just talking from, from a Norwegian perspective, is that we've, we've pursued two strategies. One is, of course, to, to adapt NATO to talk more about this. And, and um, the previous government in 2008 also launched the, um, the core area initiative, which was very helpful in this regard. Um, that was uh, presented by um, in the government of Jens Stoltenberg right, right. Uh, in that time. Um, and that was very helpful because it started to kind of make people think a bit differently about this. Uh, but we also worked bilaterally. So I had visits from from Ash Carter, then Secretary of Defense. And this is also from my, my German, my Dutch, my French, my, um, yeah, those I think, and, and British colleagues. And I took them all up north. Uh, and to try to explain and show how this looks very different from the North and to make sure that everyone knew about the strategic challenge of the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap and the need to make sure that we could have allied reinforcements across the Atlantic. And given the military developments in Russia with new submarines that are very quiet, very difficult to detect, of course it is important to, to focus on this area because this is maybe the most important link, uh, physically speaking. And as we speak now, uh, we have a joint military exercise uh, with uh, submarines, frigates, P-8s, and other things going out from Norway and discussing this area and, and exercising in this area. So, so it's absolutely a different yeah, difference to it. So I want to come back to the Russia <laughs> issue, but before we do, um, so I thought what you said was quite interesting, that on the one hand you said 
2% of GDP defense investment issue. This will be the main theme in many respects of the mm -hmm. summit. But you also, I think, cautioned, and importantly for an American audience, that a single-minded approach will not be a <laughs> successful summit, but could help, could undermine alliance yeah. unity. That political cohesion ultimately is, is a priority here. So what's your advice to the administration? What's your advice in Washington where, uh, you know, while you may have been ahead of the curve on burden sharing and yeah. return to collective defense, that has translated into Washington politically with almost an obsessive focus on 2% of GDP investment, even over the 20% investment mm -hmm. threshold that you mentioned in defense equipment. So what's your message here headed into an alliance where if you sit down with the, the US interagency, you'll hear, yes, we're at 8%, uh, eight allies up uh, now up to 2%, but that obviously leaves a lot that are not yet there. 13, they may have full national plans to get there, but that leaves many who are not yet there. Um, your own defense investment has gone up 24%, yet you're still shy of 2%, which I'm sure is something you hear sometimes from your American uh, uh, interlocutors. So how do you, what's your advice on how to handle the core issue of defense investment, which really was the animating issue for the president's rhetoric on the alliance as well? Hmm. well first, I would like to underline that it is absolutely a message that uh, is, I mean, it's, it's a fair message. And it's, Trump is not the first American president who talks about this. I mean, the, the Wales pledge came under Obama. So this is something that has been consistent over as long as I can remember and as long as I've been interacting with, with American policymakers. I think for the, for the past 15 years, this has been absolutely at the core. And I think it is fair. Uh, but I also think that we need to focus on the broader issues in addition to the 2% target. Because the 2% target is <coughs> extremely important as a way of showing burden sharing. It's extremely important because we all needed to focus more on our defense spending. Given the fact that most European countries have lived in uh, a time now after the end of the Cold War where other things were focused on, defense spending was not focused on to the same extent. So we needed to, to actually talk about this again and ramp up our defense spending. But it is, it, it's not impossible to also talk about why we need to spend more on defense and how we spend it uh, to make sure that we have the best um, both equipment and, and also uh, the best setup to meet the challenges that we need to, to deal with. And again, the value-based approach is important because ultimately this is about <coughs> defending other countries with our own soldiers. Uh, and we wouldn't do that if we didn't share values. So the minister is going to be under pressure to head to uh, interagency meetings here today. So I want to bring in a couple of comments and questions. Let me start up here with Bago and Harlan, please. Maybe I'll collect a couple of questions and uh, I'll come back uh, to the minister. Uh, uh, Vagam Ranian from Defense and Aerospace Report. Uh, great seeing you twice in one day. I'm very sorry <laughs> you're not, not feeling well. Um, you've spoken with great clarity on the importance of unity in the alliance, but we're actually um, not seeing unity in the alliance right now. Mm -hmm. And as Damon's question just raised, you know, the importance of unity and to show that, one of the biggest concerns that everybody has is that a lack of unity is going to give Putin an opportunity to make a move. Maybe make a move as he did after the Sochi Olympics, once the World Cup's over on the 15th and, and the summit meeting uh, potentially with the president. The question specifically is, what are the implications for disunity, and does that give Putin an opportunity to move and somehow severely test the alliance in a way, perhaps, that will further erode the stresses and fractures that we now see in the alliance? And, and what your expectation is, hopefully, for the meeting? Are you girding for another big surprise, for example, as everybody was after the North Korea meeting, where the president stopped, for example, exercises. So what are your expectations, and, and does this give Putin an opportunity to do something we <coughs> would rather not see? Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Let's pick up Harlan. Uh, <coughs> Madam Minister, I'm Harlan Ullman. Good to see you again. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> I may need your cough medicine. Um, <coughs> right here. <laughs> uh, I think the only person in Washington who might disagree with you lives about six blocks away. <laughs> and. Uh, <coughs> It's a real issue, because how do you convince him of the importance of NATO? Now, I would make a small bet that after he meets with Mr. Poole, I would not be surprised if, as former prime minister said, we now have peace in our time. So how do you deal with 
the President of the United States, and it's a very difficult question, who may not be as committed to NATO or all these crises you mentioned, especially if he does some kind of a deal with Mr. Putin as he did with Kim. So let me pick up one more question from this woman here. Uh, and given uh, the interest of time, if you could pass the mic back, please. Thank you. Why don't you raise your hand so she knows she's coming to you. And Hi, thanks very back. much for coming. Um, I'm Mindy Reiser. I studied at the University of Oslo, so I have oh, a warm for Norway. I'm also vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services. So the question is, in terms of the Nordic and Scandinavian countries, perhaps you could say something about their defense arrangements in addition to the NATO commitments. So as you, as you answer these, Ms. Madam Minister, um, on the Russia issue, you stated an extraordinary, and Norway's had an incredible relationship with Russia, but you described it as clear, firm, and predictable. That's not exactly the words I would use to translate the American approach. So in Harlan and Vagra's question, how do we, what's your advice for us, uh, for the administration on, on this handling? And I think the last question that you just asked, uh, Madam, also, you put out a big EU strategy this year that relates to some of the defense aspects. And because of Brexit, all this, you occupy an interesting space there. So maybe you can play out these two issues of Russia and the European, not the Nordic and European approach to security. I'll try my best. Uh, and I see that I have five minutes left, so I'll try in a very short time span to <clears throat> answer some of these quite, uh, quite very good questions, but also uh, quite complicated ones. Well, <clears throat> I think that, and I've, I've consistently said that, I think it's important that we also uh, look into what the US is doing uh, in conjunction with collective security, not only think about uh, a tweet or, or a statement. The fact of the matter is that the number of uh, money placed in, for instance, the European Deterrence Initiative has gone up. And the interest in European security as part of allied security is also increasing. Uh, we see a larger presence, we see more exercising and training, and that is welcomed by Europe. And I think we also need to underline in the, in the discussion of, of unity and disunity, because it's a very valid question, that uh, actually it is, it is not like the situation is that the U.S. is not doing anything for collective security. On the contrary, it's doing a whole lot for collective security. And, and we have to take our part as Europeans as well. So we have to have both of them when we, when we talk about this. Um, what my expectations are, well, um, I think that my expectations to this summit is that we are going to be able to maintain that allied cohesion and unity, even though we will have discussions. Obviously, we will have discussions. I don't think I've been at one single NATO meeting that hasn't had discussions. And this will happen this time as well. The, the fact is that what we end up with and come out with is, is the most important thing. And, and the facts are the ones who are the most important in this regard. What is actually happening to collective security, US, Europe? Uh, and I think that we have a lot of good things going uh, in that respect. So uh, I wouldn't be... Um, I wouldn't be too uh, anxious on kind of giving advice in, in this respect. But of course, when I, when I talk to my counterparts, and we have a, a very, very good and strong relationship both bilaterally and within the alliance, we always underline these points as very important. And we underline the fact that we, are, we have something to offer to our collective and shared security. Um, and we depend on that all allies do. Uh, when we talk about our clear, firm, and predictable relations with Russia, they have been like that consistently over different governments. It's been like this for, for decades. And it's been important that it is like that because, for instance, our NATO membership, it is very well known by Russia. The consequences of it is very well known. Our larger exercises, very well known and we know each other and our activity. So one of the things that, that are important for us is that we, when we patrol our close areas, for instance with our maritime patrol aircraft, that's, that's known activity to the Russians. They know that we do this on a daily basis. So it's not threatening. And that's also part of our bilateral relationship. Lastly, on uh, the Nordic and Scandinavian countries, <clears throat> well, I think that we have managed to get a very good and close cooperation between uh, our respective Nordic countries, even though we have different security policy affiliations. We have NATO members, non-NATO members. We have EU members, non-EU members. 
and that's likely the way it's going to stay for, for some time. Nevertheless, we are able to cooperate closely because we as a non-EU non member, we of course cooperate much with the EU uh, on security and on everything from uh, the basic uh, ideas of uh, the single market to also the new initiatives that are coming when it comes to security. Sweden and Finland, they are not NATO members, but they align themselves closely with NATO and also with the US bilaterally. So we are in a way closer and we realize um, among the five of us that no matter what happens, if something happens to one of the Nordic countries, it will likely affect the others in one way or the other. So that's why we have also an enhanced security policy dialogue. We have NORDEFCO, the Nordic Defense Corporation, as also working, in my opinion, better now than it did five or 10 years ago. Madam Minister, we're gonna close so you can get off to the White House, but I just wanna ask one sentence. Um, will we see a signal, a positive signal towards enlargement with Athens and Skopje making progress here? Just a quick headline on that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, but I'm hoping that also uh, gives a push to the respective governments in actually uh, landing the deal, definitely. Uh, and uh, from what I hear from the last NAC meeting that was taking place just a couple of days ago, that it was a positive signals also from NAC on starting discussions on, on membership uh, issues. So Perfect. we'll see. All we'll right, see. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I'll take that.